It's it's been a pleasure, a pleasure for me to be a part of Glenn Merkin's master class of architecture, world master class of architecture of all them years. And uh, I guess if anyone should feel privileged, it has to be me. A kid that was born beside a sacred water hole. And um, then traveled from north to south and back. And being a fugitive in my own homelands or dodging the dreaded welfare. And now, uh, police. While my parents moved and had to keep moving because they didn't want to lose us kids. This might sound a bit of a sob story, but. But I did. I think I talked to you about something out there, and I'm talking to you something here, and and about our movements of understanding totems. We don't get a totem. My personal totem when I was born was a little banded plover, and he came up to my mum when I was born. And my auntie said, that's Dula Munman's personal totem. Because the family totem is a little willy wagtail, little black and white bird, who carries on when there's something bothering him. And it's only for that the little bird was the totem that kept me and my brothers and sisters from being a part of the stolen generation. Because they, they came about two or three days before the welfare and police used to come around. And then So we, we started to understand all these totemic things and signs. The signs of communication without voice was a very important thing for me and my family to know. And uh, I... Um, I had to really look at it and, and understand it as I was growing up. Then, probably about 1946, and, um, 10 years of age. And uh, I was given an old head. And when I mean, what I mean by that, I was walked from Victoria back up into New South Wales with my grandfather and three uncles. So I had this knowledge of the land every time I took a step of coming back into safety. Still this time running from the Victorian uh, police and welfare. And 
And then there were stories told to me. And one of them was about the whale, a gruel whale. And even now I'm, I've written a book about that. It's not published yet. So why I'm telling you this is just a bit because you have to understand my discipline that I had to go through to be given the knowledge of understanding and the knowledge of our culture for signs and stories and and I loved every minute of it. So I wasn't allowed to go to school and because mum and them wouldn't put me to school because I could have been I'd probably be taken to school and then not coming home because welfare or something could have got me taken me out of school so she wasn't going to run the risk here and dad and aunties and uncles and grandfather. So that, that just left me and my brothers and sisters uh, just being these I still, well, just just staying a nomadic person. But everywhere we walked, everywhere we went, we learned about the land, learned about the environment. But most of all, we learned about nature and how nature is the greatest teacher of all. You can have all your professors, you can have all your scientists, but nature is still the greatest teacher of all. If you've got an open mind, if you understand. And the most important thing about that is if that's if you have the teachers to teach you. And fortunately, that's what I have. So, we used to go fishing and walking everywhere and, you know, going fishing, you're walking for about three or four miles up the beach, away from camp and just learning everything about, about the waters, the waterways, the rocks, and looking, understanding, understanding the land. And so at that time, I, I think I was, I was three, my mind, was so open at that age, I can never ever forget it. When the old people said to me about this particular place called Mystery Bay, it wasn't it wasn't a mystery about about being there, but it was a mystery about what happened there where a robbery took place and a murder took place and all this other stuff. So, there, have I got a little pointer thing that I can use? My finger's not long enough. <laughs> Done. Okay, so, so uh, if we... If we look at the top line that's running across and 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 we 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 just look down can yeah thanks Dina that that this is a particular place that 
that I've been talking about. So we walk from way down here at this place called called uh, Wallaga Lake, way down. Here you can see some of the... Uh, see, see a part of the road here. This was a mission right down here. And that's where they... That's where they, the government put, put a lot of our mob and put them on that mission so that they can make sure that they were all in one place and not be roaming about anywhere on landers, on all this land here. Because that land is was being developed then for farming. And cows, pigs, goats, horses. And our soft-footed animals were replaced for hard hoofed animals, which also helped to start to destroy it a bit. But Mystery Bay It was about it was about this this uh, incident that that uh, that that happened, and um, I said, well, I was told that they were, this is where something something bad happened once. But the most important thing, this is where something very important happened. And I didn't know that until probably about another five years later or seven years later as I got up to around about seven or eight and I started to understand just a little bit more about, about the teachings. Mystery This this one's in the in the road here, isn't it a bit? Can we take that away? <laughs> but look. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm going to be blocking your views out for 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 some years, but uh, uh, this year, before all this sand and that got there, uh, this this wonderful party of of uh, of of, uh, of mystery, and that uh, was 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 so important. What do they call this boat harbour? Point. Yeah, see? Right? So if we look at how this the sea is, this is all sand now. Right? This is a road that comes down. Now all this sand was washed up. Running down down this way is a little creek that has now been all blocked over. And coming down up here with this road, uh, here is another creek that runs out. And some of the old people used to get water out of those two creeks. They also looked at something else. And they said, wow. This will be good because to even spear fish and chase fish down here on the on the side of the the ocean is a little bit harder to do. So let's look at let's look at um, developing something for our people so that we can we can uh, 
just be able to go and pick up fish. No boats, no nets, and we didn't need a spear to do that. So the thing was all about, you know, this 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 water hole that is about here, where the fish were taken into. And what you do then is you 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 get into the water hole and you start feeling fish and tickling them and lift them up. Oh, yeah, he's not big enough. Let him go. We can get him another time or something like that. It took the, in, the architectural and engineering skills of the ancients 16,000 years ago or more. You see, they too never had a schooling. The only schooling that they had was about culture and habitat and many other things of making things and doing things. So they looked they looked at these wonderful uh, areas of of mystery and if you can see some rocks and formation of rocks up here, going right up, as I said, the sand wasn't there. But some of the bigger rocks, you can see some of the people here, you can see some of the rocks there. So, so, so some of the bigger rocks where, where, where they had to, to move them, because what they'd done, they had to sit down and they had to wait for all your different moons to have a look at the level of water, high tides and low tides. So it's taken a fair while for them to do that. But then to put bigger rocks in place, you know, they never had cranes, but all they had was skill. So great big rocks, possibly like this, they had to move them. Not far, but move them. And so they would put these long poles, tie these long poles to the rock, but down low. And they used to have to wait until high tide. Again, they had to watch the tides. So when the odd tides came, that helped them lift that big stone with the long poles. Just enough for the old fella that was sitting, you always know, had a longer arm. But if you see this big rock just here, and you see see a spare place up there, and you see a little bit of little bit of bush to the right, so fell out to sit there, and he had to sit there on his butt and sing out or wave, "Dadaloo, okay? Dadaloo," because he's watching the water hit the rocks and then run them down. And then putting rocks in place, putting all these rocks in place. So when it run down, gave this channel back, there's something there, into this area when the fish went in to this pond. And that gave them the opportunity then just to go and tickle the fish. You tickle the fish and their gills open. So you just stick your finger in the gills and lift them out. And if it's not big enough, if the fish is too small, if the fish isn't the right one, see, because some of the old people are so choosy in, in what, they're, what they're 
fish was or what their meat was. They couldn't eat this kind of meat and that kind of meat. That included fish. Fish is not just fish for everybody, as you possibly know. So, more harder times then. Not like in a fish market today, you can go in and look and see a sign, oh, that's barracuda, this is a mullet, and all oh, this is a brim, and, you know, salmon. Then the old people had to, they were selective, but they were pretty good at their selection in how they'd done it. And if they kept one out, and some of the ancients then started to to look at the, the food that they had, and there'd be a celebration. But that wasn't until they seen these two creeks on both sides of that structure. Because these two creeks brought down the nutrients, both sides of the fish traps. And they went out that way and out into the area over this way. And that was so important for them to look and survey the two creeks. So the two lots of nutrients came down. And for what I don't know, they could have they could either planted other plants back up further in the two creeks so that some nutrition or some other things could be brought down, brought down in the water out into the ocean to get the fish in. So that's why the fish came in came in both both sides of the fish traps. And every time the water came in both ways. See that that was just all observation. When you water when the when the waves come in both ways and they hit these hit these rocks that were put in place and taken down until it was run out or to run into this great big pool. So, we can see a lot of rock there, but from where the cars are, see, there's still a lot of rock un under there and come down here towards this pool here. And that's, that's, where, that's, that's where the finger done the fishing then. It wasn't the spear. So if you put a spear into that fish and you didn't need it, it would be more or less a waste. So this is the selective, the selective things that the ancients used to do. So but there's lots of rocks. The how that water came down and a little little space that came through and into this area. But from right up there, if you can see the two lots of water now, the waves are breaking, going in, these ones coming this way, see? And they brought the fishes in right up there, just above this fully that's got his thing on, but he, up, up towards those cars, see? And just under the cars you'll see you'll see some uh, vegetation, which is all food anyway. 
and that that vegetation. So above that and just above that last car on my right is where this old man had to sit and do all the directing. Hey, what a director, eh? What a director. To be able to sit there, get the men to put rocks in place. Now, there's still a lot, a lot of rock there that's not shown because there's the sand. And when you get the nor'easter, you're taking all that more sand from there, this way, and that's what does more damage to the fish traps. So, we've got to look at solving that problem or bringing it back to what it used to be like from 16, 14, 13, 1,000 years ago. So to have that structure like that with just poles lifting great rocks just in place enough by looking at your waterways coming in, that took an engineering feat, I believe. How long did it take them to sit and think of that? Why did they want to build such a big engineering feat? We have old places now that is built and they're becoming relics. I mean, some places that were put up about 200 years ago. I mean buildings. And they've been looked on as what, what, what do you call that word? Heritage. An old place that's not even 300 years old. And that old dwelling is then classed as that heritage. But yet we've got things that's 40 and 50,000 years old. And we want to try and keep it that way. But it's fallen on deaf ears. It's falling on people who don't give a shit about ancient culture. But they worry about something that is not 200 years old or not 300 years old. And for the love of me, I can't understand that. For the love of me, I cannot, I cannot comprehend that. Gee, that's a big word for me. But I, I cannot understand it. See, all I'm doing is putting comparisons here. And the ancientness that the ancients done without big machinery. But it was skill and hard work and letting the water teach him. And then not only the water to teach them. And I think I mentioned it out here. Grandmother Moon. Looking at air times coming up. 
over the ocean, understanding the fullness of it. out of the ocean. And that's what the old people relied on. They looked at all that. They looked at the colour of leaves, the changing of blossoms, the changing of flowers. It became such an important part in their survival, could I call it survival? I don't know. But that's what they'd done in this place of sacredness. And when we talk about our sacred places, Oh, yeah. <clears throat> but I guarantee if I came to an heritage building in this city that they called Sydney and desecrated it, only with just a little bit of spray paint and that I would be jailed. Doing something that's not even 300 years old, that's been looked on as a heritage. We have trees that's older than that, and they'll cut them down and desecrate them. We have lots of things that we said, and it wasn't until 19... 67, that as Aboriginal people, we became human. We became human. But which was one of the biggest political stunts in this country. They just wanted all us blacks to vote to put the powers to be in government. You see, all our history is based, is based against a war of powers to be. All our things. In our, one of our sacred mountains, it'll be coming up here in a minute. One of our sacred, sacred mountains, no, not yet, mate, I don't want that one yet. I want to go back to what Dino can talk uh, just a little bit about mystery. Now, before I go, go up to this mountain that's not far away from Mystery Bay. I just want to share with you something I learned recently. Um, I never met Uncle Max's teachers. Even did any of you guys. But by the way Uncle talks and the way he teaches, we can tell that they are very special men. So a couple of weeks ago, I got to ask to look at something, not by Uncle Max, by another lady in my community. And I started reading something. By mistake, I found a little writing. It was just a little writing. And it was about Uncle Max's teachers, who were three brothers. And I read this little writing and I said, there's probably only so many people who understand how valuable this little bit of writing is. Because what this person wrote about was Uncle Max's teachers and how they moved up and down the coast north to south, and they would call in and they would stay at certain camps. And I thought, if that old auntie didn't get me to look for something else, I wouldn't have found that, and I never would have found that writing. So it was very valuable. 
Um, and I still think, you know, how important that was to understand who their men were or what they looked like. Um, and that movement of, of back and forth, up and down the coast, north to south, south to north. Um, Uncle talked about walking um, from Wallaga Lake to Sydney, you know, or even further, Victoria um, and up. We wouldn't even imagine to do that today, but for the culture and the teaching he did. So this place here, Mystery Bay, um, my people are still going there and they don't even know why. But it's been happening for a long, long time. We're talking about thousands of years. Where I live, or I grew up, La Perouse, a certain time of year, all my people will go here and camp here for weeks. But they still don't know. They just go there. They know nothing about the fish traps. Um, yet this is where I taught my kids to swim, where I taught them to look for certain types of fish, uh, mainly what we call mutton fish, abalone, because it was safe. You know, and I watched them waters and we knew that we had to get out of there before them two waters came and blocked us in and then we'd have to swim out. But I also, in my own time without my children, I swam on, I swam the whole lot of this and looked for different fish. But this area on, on what is our left looking at the screen, I swam in there because um, I could always get what I needed because everyone else would swim a bit further, but in close, there was special stuff that was always there. But I also seen a change um, at certain times because I went there a lot and that was like my little safety net. When I needed a feed and I could get it easy, I would go in this little corner here. But one of the things I, I realised, or will Uncle fill the gap in for me, was the first time I realised this was important was... I was in here about, oh, it would have been 20 years ago, and I was swimming on that left-hand side in shallow water. But all these fish were there, and they were all different fish. There were brim, there were blackfish, there were drummer, but there was lots of them, and they were in shallow water. The penny didn't drop then. It was only after Uncle Max showed me this. When he showed me it from up there on the grass with other men, and we looked out and he said, that's, a f that's the fish traps. He didn't give us many um, of the gaps we needed like he's give you, Mob, tonight. Some of this stuff I'm really hearing for the first time about, about the creeks and the nutrients um, because he wants us to look at that and observe it. But it was only recently that I asked Uncle Max again or I told him about the fish told him about the fish in there and that was in the last 12 months because I went back into that area and then fish were back and there were lots of them. And I said to Uncle, there was lots of fish in there. He said, yeah, genealogical memory. The fish remember the traps. So they're coming back looking for the traps to be working. I thought, oh, wow, look at that. Look at what I just got then. Um, because I didn't realise the fish were coming back with the memory, that they passed it down. Just like we do to our children, we pass down the legacies, we pass down the memories, the stories. Well, the fish have done the same thing. And what's missing is the structure for them fish to come back in and, and really do what they're doing, because what the old people did, they didn't really trap them. They, they built a system that naturally let them come in and out, you know, in their own way. Um, kept them healthy, not like sticking a dolphin or a, or a killer whale in a, in a pool, in a park, um, for people to view and let them do tricks. This was done all natural, working with nature. So, um, what we've done for Uncle, because what we don't want to see happen is our culture get lost. Nothing got lost anyway because everything the old people had way back then is still here. There might be some houses and roads there, but the spirit of what they did and the ceremony and that energy is still in the land. 
And this is why these fish are coming back. They can feel that energy. Um, so what we've done is we've developed a project so that Uncle Max's legacy, his teacher's legacy, and the ancients that come before can see that legacy live. So we've created a project. And it wasn't fair the way we had to go about it, jumping through government hoops, dealing with the bureaucracy, writing stuff that we don't really believe in, the square box. We believe in nature, and that should be our law, and that's the way we should live by. Every day we probably break the law by, by what we're doing, the natural living law. So we've created a fishing project, and what we'll do in June this year is we'll fish all, all day and we'll do our, our stuff with our families, with our women and our children and the other men and whoever turns up that uncle wants to be there. But at night, we'll watch these waters again move and we'll see what nature teaches us and we'll observe just like them old fellas did up there. We'll watch all that movement because... This is a project that needs to happen and the only way we can make it happen is if we start to live it again. And by observing it, which was a big part of my old people's ways, was sitting for hours, whether it was asking for permission or trying to look at nature, teach them, they would sit there for hours and do that. Not just go and sit on the beach for 10 minutes and, and we know everything. No, they would sit there and, and watch and wait, and that might take a couple of days to do. Well, we're gonna do that in June and we're gonna sit up there on that grass with our families and, and watch and see what we can learn. The other beautiful thing about this is our, our mothers, our, our partners, our wives will be part of that. But they have a different way of looking at things as, as our genders are a little bit different, even though that me and Uncle Max come from woman and we're part woman, women will look at things differently and they will see the feminine side of country and we will see the masculine side. And so well, then we can put that together and those ideas and that vision and who knows, you know, what this will teach us. Because this wasn't just about catching fish. It would have been also about sustainability, making sure that you only take enough for today, that you don't take it all because it's just there on the shelf or in the fish shop, that we make sure that these fish keep on coming back. So this is a very special, very special project um, that needs a lot of spirit to move forward and, and develop into the engineering and the architecture that these old people did. And I think Uncle will also want us to, to also have a feel around in there and see what we can find in our observations. Sitting, yes, but also looking for where some of that, that structure might be and start to work it out. And, um, these are the special things we do. Um, and what we say is there's no coincidence in what we do. The fact that Uncle Max has been travelling with some of these men and women for 16 years in your, um, in your organisation um, just tells me that it's important that we're here and we're doing this, that we're sharing this story with you guys. There's a lot of trust. And as you know, Uncle Uncle's saying is, the more I share, the more I keep. I've got to give it away to keep it. Right? Because... If you guys don't understand our heritage, and this is heritage, we don't have, well, 15,000 years. Uncle talked about other things that are only 200 years, like the Harbour Bridge. It's heritage. A pub is heritage. Uh, but yet, a structure 16,000 years old is not valuable in this country. You know, and it's not a blame thing. It's not about blaming you people, but it's about making you aware so that you guys can look after it too. When you look at a heritage that's 80,000 years and upwards, 
Um, it's got to be important because there's not another human race on this planet that has lived that long. And if there is, I, I want to meet them so we can learn from them. But look, um, this is what we'll be doing. A lot of what we do is about looking after the land, not destroying the land. Um, I'll go to a meeting on Sunday uh, where people will oppose us from doing this project and there'll be a lot of money involved in that meeting. But I've already said to myself and that meeting that I will not take any of your money because it's not about looking after country. So this is what we need to do. This is the real stuff. Talking to people like you guys, this is the real stuff. We don't have things as unreal, just like we don't have coincidence. So thank you for allowing me to be here with Uncle. Um, there was an opportunity there and, and I took it, not to get knowledge off Uncle, to support Uncle. But I always know that when I do that, something special happens. So I don't need to worry about um, where I'm going tomorrow. Um, I just need to worry about what we're doing now and that we've got your ears for this little while and your, your ears are open, your minds are open, but also spiritually, you know, you guys are in the right place understanding this stuff because we've just shared something very special with you um, that not a lot of people get to know about. So thank you, Uncle, um, and now you'll enjoy the mountain. So thanks. Yeah, see, um, holy moly, I'm, uh, I'm no good at technology. Uh, I'm computer literate. Uh, because I have all my stuff here that can show me things and tell me without voice. And to get to, to, get to understand the, all this part of the sacred mountain, this part of the sacred mountain is, as you can see with the Water's brought down and got a lot of things hanging there. So the torrents and the force of the water is is just just common sense. Common sense to know it, that all this here was washed and smashed away to make to make way down to gutter the sea and to be able to get people to understand about that, that water movement from coming up to the top. The only time you see water running uphill is through a pipe. So this is, this is the part of, of a mountain that, that follow called J.C. James Cook sailed up the east coast and he's seen this mountain and oh he said now we'll call that mountain dromedary because it looks like a camel and I couldn't understand this name a dromedary. Yeah. Oh no, no, I, I just can't understand this. Because I was told that the mountain was a gulaga, mother mountain of sacredness, with the story of the birth of the human people. Same as the Bible, you know, the Bible, I talk about Adam and Eve. But only the thing, a little bit of difference with our story is that the 
the woman was born first. And when I was told this at the age of 10 or 12, I questioned my elders. I questioned my teachers. And I said, uh, no pop, and no uncles, you mean, you mean that Tunku, the male, was created first? And they looked at me. And then grandfather said to me, he said, next time you see a man pregnant, you come and let me know. And I said, I want you to remember that. I want you to have that respect for the woman. I need you to care for that. I need you to really understand that. Okay. Because I wasn't going to argue with five of them. And old fellas who knew more about life than me. And so I, I, really, I, I really had to look at what they were talking about. I really had to sit and understand why they were saying this and why they were correcting me, you know. And then I knew what right did I have to correct my elders. Because if I'm trying to correct my elders, then I'm correcting the old people before them and before them and before them. And go it goes on like that. So I I looked at it. And I had no option but to understand and accept what grandfather and these old uncles were, were talking about. This part here is about a great courts that is the storyline through it and many other things tell <laughs> tells me about what this court could do and what we can do with the court and how it can become sacred in an area. How we could look at the redness then look at our, look at our arms, look, look at our legs Look at all our veins of the blood running through it. And how, we had, how I had to understand that, why that blood was running through my veins, to let me carry, to enable me to carry the story and to understand the stories of the ancients. So that was a, a good awakening for me. This is all a part of the mountain. This is when the water's coming from the top down to the bottom to hit the lakes, the rivers and to bring all that nutrition down so that most of your fishes can, can go. Now we come into these, some of these work and, work and places of, we start to look at, at, uh, at some of these trees and some of these, some of these gigantic trees and that, that that, is, that tells stories and that there are lots of stories there in, in these trees. 
these are not just to pretty the face, the place up, but they're there for medicinal purposes and healing purposes. See, and how you use it, and when you use it, is another thing. This is a grandson of mine. He's inside the whale. He said, Pop, I want to be Jonah the whale. And so he got, he got inside this thing that he looked on as being a whale. This is on one of our sacred islands. But, but back to the mountain, why did Cookie call it uh, dromedary? Dromedary is a camel, isn't it? You see, the only thing that I can see wrong with that, he was out on sea for so long he forgot the shape of a woman. See? It's a woman lying down with her feet. And he called it dromedary just because he's seen a hump. And the hump that he's seen was the most pregnant part. Could we go to that one now? Oh, that's just doing sunrise. That's me and my two grandsons doing sunrise ceremony. And we do that every time we go down there, we get up and greet the sun. Because it's the first day for the rest of our life. And we hold on, I get him to hold on to that. Is how and why do we do this? This, the beautiful colours in this, is the beautiful healing stuff that comes from that tree. Cuts and abrasions, toothaches, aches and pains. That's what us do doing there, showing us. See, again. It's the land talking to us with that voice. You know, remember the old day that the traffic cops were diggers? They done that. And that, right? all that direction was signals. No voice, but just signals. And these are all signals of ancient medicines, healing properties. How do we get it? And all this part is where the, we look at it's being washed out to sea and to understand it, to look at the nutrients that's gone being sifted through those rocks and sand. Excellent young guy. Here you are. This is one of my one of my uh, favourite ones. That's where I had a walk through once when I was a kid, going through my law. I've gone through that. You see. It's still standing. That was there for many, many years. It's still standing there today. And I probably went through that when I was about 10 or 12 through my initiation. 12, so that's 72 years ago. 
is still standing straight and strong and to understand it, to know why all these things were taken, to be put into book form. This went into my book called My People's Dreaming. And, uh, yeah, this one is a very important one. Again, about the woman, the mother. This is on the sacred mountain, on the ridge, where you can walk through for 20 minutes. Take you about 40 minutes to walk out and back again. But with the teachings, <clears throat> it just takes a little bit longer. This is the child been nurtured before it goes up onto a teaching rock. And that is all. All these things are in place in a straight line. And then people say to me, how come it's in a straight line? Well, all those big rocks. See, they're humongous. They're 20 and 30 foot high. How come? <clears throat> that these rocks are like that. And me with my sense of humour, I said, well, the old fellas built a sky crane and they put them all in line so we can have a storyline. And I have some people saying, really? And I'm thinking, oh, my God. You know? It's the next one, right? <clears throat> but this one here is the start of the journey. And this is seen to be back to front. This is the one we should have started off with. <clears throat> This is, this is the start of the journey. This is where the story begins. That rock, that one on top, to get people to get around there and touch it. And then you can feel the energy. You can feel the energy of just about everything. Mean, you can feel pulsation. Pe people, people feel as their hands are going into the rock. And you'll see them pulling back as, we, as we're teaching them and trying to show them trying to teach them about this creation rock <clears throat> is where the energy was taken to create this old story about Gulaga and its creation. <clears throat> that's young Kai Handel and that's me there. This is the rainbow serpent. It's about 20-odd feet raising up. Now, we're back down on uh, down near Misty Bay. And what, what, do you know the, the difference? Can you notice the difference now with the terrain? Can you see the different stone? You've got the sandstone down there now back up on the mountain, we've got the black granite. That's all these, all these formations. That's a journey up the mountain. Here we go, mate. Now, when Dharam, our great creator, created the first two human people, as the story goes, Dharma created Ngadi. Ngadi, yeah, Ngadi is the woman. And that's where I had a bit of a, bit of a, have a go at my grandfather and uncles. I was lucky I didn't get a bundi over their head for challenging them. Because I was saying, but Pop, uncle, the Bible said, that Adam was created first. And they put me in place. 
So I, I zipped the lip, I shut up, and then that's, that one in line with that one, that's Tunku. Tunku is the male. And you see the form of why it's the male, it's like the penis. Right? So there's the woman and the man. Now, they're taken in line like that because that's exactly how, it, but, but the photos were put because in between those two rocks, those two top the Ngadi, the female, and Tunku, the male, there's a rock and a tree. And so the first gift that Dharma great creator gave Ngadi and Tunku was a rock and a tree. And so that rock and tree was the survival of our existence and how we had to survive for all them years on this planet. Just a rock and a tree. Might make sense to you, but... And again, there's that, there's that beautiful healing rock. Ah. Anyone say anything there? Hey. Eh? Once you see that, seeing the baby in the womb that was born from the mother and came up to be like that. See, any child that's in the womb of the mother, you'll see it exactly like that. And that's why we as Aboriginal people have to respect that woman for carrying the child. So important for us as men. Now, this, this is down in Victoria. This, this, is, this is up from, uh, um, down from a place called Bendock in Victoria on a on a back road coming up from Orbost up to uh, up to Delicate in New South Wales. So 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 this is where I had to go to to, to get all these photographs of of all these uh, tall timbers to give people to give people understanding of of the flatness of 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 the land where it wasn't down in the valley and growing up so big to reach up. So once you start to look at the environment, and that's what you you mob as architects could really look at. If if you look at your you look at the environment and your escarpment, there's very little escarpment there. It's all about the flat country there. But they have big trees that's reaching up skyward. Is another thing. I had to go all around that because that, that was a very important learning place for me. This is my eldest grandson. Uh, that's Max the third. I'm one, my son's two, uh, he's three, and my great grandson is Max four. So there's a lineage of Max. You know, and I had no say in that. My wife named Maximus and this is the little fella that kept me and my family for being a part of the stolen generation. He good little fella that. He's that little messenger bird. Anyone throw a stick at, at him, I'll throw a stone at you. You know, because that's what kept me and my sisters and brothers freedom from welfare. Very important. 
the tall timbers, the huge trunks, and the untouched beauty of that particular area is how we have to look at things. One of the things about the, the big trees was, is how would you feel if you drew your masterpiece, sketch your masterpiece, and you think it suited that part of the environment, and you wanted to put your masterpiece that you drew and put on land there. But the people that is going to get your masterpiece to build their home, see, that's what I talked to a couple of the, well, put your hands up. Uh, I talked to you about your your masterpiece and what, what you would do if, come on, don't be shy. That's better. There's three of them there. Right? How would they feel if they had this they had this serene place to put this beautiful building that they wanted in? And then it would knock back. Or how would they feel if that was granted? But then again, we build this building in a place that's going to interrupt the environment. So how would we feel about that? See, these are the things that we need to look at. These are the things that we could understand. And when I had Lindsay talking about, the professor here talking about, that environmental thing is what you've all got to go through and look at. Just showing all that stuff. This is the this is the sacred island. Plenty of food there. Plenty of food there. But this is uh, this is what we have to look at about understanding the environment and really looking at the environment. The environment are not there to suit your master piece of architecture that you want to plump there. So you've got to really start to wonder, look, start to look and feel the land. What the land talk to you and understand it. These are all other areas of like this this photographer, Peter Mack, who, who took that, if you can see the sprays, why he took it and he captured, he captured the movement of the ocean. He captured a part of the ocean leaving the ocean, see, and coming up out from the rocks. These are some of the things I asked him to do. Show me where it's leaving the ocean. Show me how it's coming off the rocks. And his eye for, for, for that was spot on. This simple little thing here, you might be able to see what it really means. But if you look at the track, you look at the fires and you see the thing called a grave. So in this movement with burial is what we do. We move it in that fashion between those fires or near those fires and come in the entry of the east. And why do we do that? 
because we're coming from the first sunrise. We're coming in from when the sun is first coming up. So how are we going to put our body down? We know that we should be coming. So we come in the east. We walk to the west. We take the bodies around to the south, back to the north, and there to the marking where the grave is. So we, we do it in that fashion. And once you, once you look at that, that sketch like that, what does it look like? Can anyone tell me? Yeah? You're nodding? Sora? Burn. That's what, what, that's what it represents. It represents the sperm. So as we're putting someone down, we're not lost forever. Our next generation comes after us. And that is a very sacred movement. But we do that three times within that circle. And then puts the body down. Have a look at this little twig here springing up out of the ground. You know, these are the things that we need to look at. And where do we put our house? At times, if you look just back over here, where I'm in now, me and Dino, I see not far away there's a humongous tree laying there. A little bit closer, whack, there would be no house there. See? So, so this is what the safety thing is all about, just what, what they be quality, although they're sturdy, although they're worth name. But what's up top? They might look safe all down there. It's a pretty big, pretty big tree that. And it might look safe. But up top, they like to shed things, same as us. Shed air. Okay, young guy, and this is this is some more uh, uh, visions, ghostly figures on the island. If you just 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 look at them, this is my first lot of dances that I had, and uh, the old them lads. Apart from this falleria, they're nearly all gone. They've now departed and left this planet, and why that happened. They broke sacred law. They'd done the wrong thing, because each and every one of them follows. Only that one follow that is still standing today. They went back to drink and smoke and doing all things wrong to other people. You know, they're not there for me to discipline. So, so there's very little I can do about that. But all I can do is just look at this part of the sacred island and those two rocks way down the end is the places that I done ceremony with each and every one of them fellows. Ladies and gentlemen, hi. I think this is good news. Again, holding on for dear life. 
This is all about Misty Bay. So I just want to thank you. I know I kept you up just a little bit too long after you, before you, after everybody bid time. But I can take you out of, have a, now sleep and be up and doing things. See? Things that we can do. Things that we can do if we train our mind to do it. The things that are so important to each and every one of us that every time you open your eyes, remember where you were last yesterday because you're not there tomorrow. Because you're not living it. You can look at the past, then you look at self, and you do your own personal inventory on you, not point the finger at the next person. Every time you point the finger, you've got three pointing back to you. Now that's something, folks, that is very important. Remember that. Just be careful what you're doing. Glenn, Professor, young guy, tall fellow. Thank you, thank you, Dean, for helping me with this part. I'm sorry if we went over time. My apologies. So now we might wake up in the hall in the morning and get on the grass and greet the sun, eh? Six o'clock? What time does the sun rise? Eh? <laughs> He's a clever man, this fella. <laughs> hey, he isn't going to open his eyes. <laughs> oh, yes, I only want to get up and greet the sun with me up on the grass. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> so, so I don't know where you are, but I might get Dean out to go around clapping the sticks. <laughs> so don't throw rocks at him. <laughs> okay, but I'm just asking if anyone want to come down <clears throat> and just do this great the sun for the first day for the rest of your life. That's all it is. Just greet grandfather for the first day for the rest of your life. When I say that, I don't mean to say that you have to get up every morning. But you get up on those mornings <clears throat> and you greet the sun and you just give thanks. And we put you through a simple little ceremony. It's just a simple one. So those who turn up, I'd welcome you to come. So good night, good folks. And, yeah.